had a nice conversation with an investor who made $31,000 on his first flip ever. That's the topic of today's show. Let's dive in. Back, 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 back to those days. I was running, 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 running in one place. Set a, set a, set a, set a, set a, set a, set a pace. Feel like I've been, I've been, I've been, I've been running in one place. Yeah, I've been feeling pretty good. I've been feeling great. I've been feeling how I should, how I really should. Hey, real estate investors, welcome to another episode of the House Flipping Show here on Holton Wise TV. As always, I am your host, James Wise. Behind the scenes, we've got my main man, Tommy, cutting the footage up for you. Today's show, guys, it's all about a conversation I had with a guy by the name of Harvey Jurgen. He is a flipper, a real estate agent, and a home investors franchise owner. He does uh, flips, and he blogs about them, and he puts out some pretty nice content. I will link all of that in the show notes below. And uh, the particular deal that we spoke about he had made over $31,000 on the deal, very professionally done. As a matter of fact, he's got all this good content about all these flips, and he did so well on this flip. I didn't even realize this till we were halfway through our conversation, but that particular flip was actually the first house he'd ever flipped. Let's take a look at the footage now. All right, Harvey, so you, you own a, a home investors franchise down in Columbus, Ohio? That's right. Yep, I'm in Columbus, and we actually just opened a home investors franchise. What were you doing with your business before you decided to go with the Homevestors franchise? Like, were you flipping houses like independently or what happened? Yeah. So we had an independent um, buy and hold and flipping business, um, just me and my wife really. And then joined forces with a partner down here and opened up a Homevestors franchise. And it, what, what, what was the reasoning for going with the Homevestors route? Does it help with like marketing when you're looking for distressed sellers or... Yeah, so one of the things we were running into when we were operating by ourselves was we were, we were mostly purchasing from wholesalers and or the MLS, I guess. And so that was eating into our margin. So we definitely wanted to go direct to seller and get some of that margin back. And then we also, I have some friends and a mentor down here who are home investor franchisees and we realized that we could benefit a lot from, yeah, the marketing and the brand recognition, but also the systems that they have in place um, and a lot of the, the IT platforms that they have in place that we thought are seeing that could really help our business, those, those platforms and those uh, systems. Okay, because getting, getting to the, the actual distressed seller, right? That's like the biggest thing with flipping. Well, I mean, mm -hmm. there's a lot. There's a lot involved with flipping, right? You know, mm -hmm. people think it's like market dependent or I, I see people always asking questions online or there's some emails or to make comments like, hey, what's a good market for flipping? You know, is this market good for flipping? But, you know, it's not really dependent on, you know, markets at all. Right. It's about right. your skill set. It's about your ability to find an undervalued home. Like every market has values. You just have to mm -hmm. find an undervalued home and then you have to have the ability uh, to properly run the renovation. Now, the house that I brought you onto the show to discuss, right, it was, it was pretty damn ugly, dude. It was a pretty ugly little house. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the pictures you showed us, right, you had a bunch of shit in there, and it's, it's yeah. just ugly. It's like right. a, just like a gross, like, I don't even know, is that like a gross yellow, off yellow or something, tan? Yeah, it was definitely an off yellow, just kind of everywhere. Yeah, so that's pretty gross, but based upon the numbers, <laughs> right? you made some pretty good money off of that, right? You picked it up yeah. for 37,000 and mm -hmm. we'll get into the numbers in, in more detail as you uh, explain the story to us, but you ended up making over 30 grand. That, I mean, that's a lot of yeah. money. Right. Was the fact that you have the ability now to directly market to those motivated sellers, was that one of the biggest things that transformed your flipping business that allowed you to pull off these $30,000 deals? Well, yeah, and actually that was, that flip was before Homevestors. So, um, so the acquisition cost on that particular project was 33 and then we paid a wholesaler. Um, I think the assignment fee was four grand. Okay. Um, yeah. So, you paid 33 and then mm -hmm. you had to pay 4,000 to this wholesaler. And then you ended up when it all shook out, you made 31 grand. Yep. So you decided then that like, Hey man, let's cut out that $4,000 loss. Let's add that to our profit margin. So like on future deals with the way your business is set up, you know, like if you ran into the same deal, your idea would hopefully to be to get to that seller first. So instead of making 31, you get to make 35. 
Yeah. And there's, there's, you know, yeah, we keep that four grand, but we also, who knows what we could have, what price we could have negotiated with the seller. Uh, so that's the other thing too. We were, we've been running into was not just that margin that the wholesaler gets to keep, but maybe some of that negotiation on the front end with the seller, that there might be um, some money left on the table there. And then just the ability to scale at a, at a quicker rate and not have to depend on three to five wholesalers to bring us deals, but have access to our own deals. Now <clears throat> let's, let's talk about the negotiation a little bit. Like what are some like good negotiation tactics that you and your wife like to use when you're speaking with these motivated sellers? Like how do you turn like this deal, right? I would say this was a great deal though. 31,000. That's a yeah, good profit. Solid. Mm -hmm. But you know, you had 4,000 on the table for the wholesaler. You think you could have even got a little bit more by negotiating a better deal. So how do you take a solid deal like this, like a triple, how do you turn it into the home run, man? Like what are some things that you would do if you're sitting down talking to a, a motivated seller? Yeah, I think the big thing that we're learning is a, when you, once you get inside of there, there's a reason that they called. There's a reason that they're in the situation that they're in. And there's a reason that they want to sell their house probably at a discount. Uh, I think the big thing is to establish rapport with those sellers um, and then figure out where the pain points are and be more focused on providing solutions for them to meet them in that point of pain where they're at, as opposed to, I guess, what you could call traditional selling which is talking about our features and benefits and talking about why they should sell to us more so establishing a relationship um, and then providing them solutions. And sometimes I think that that process may take several months. Uh, I think very rarely does it happen on that first visit. Nice. So you kind of have like a, a long term strategy. So your, your essential lead acquisition strategy is to market directly to these folks and just continue to keep your pipeline full and then just touch base with them, you know, right. Until they eventually, if they, if they need, you know, you explain your services and then if they need those services, you're yep. just remaining in contact with them and eventually they'll decide if they're going to take you up on your offer or not. Yep. It's all about follow up. That's pretty clever, man. I like that. We utilize a lot of that here at Holton Wise with our marketing, you know, drip campaigns, things of that yep. nature, right. you know, semi-regular scheduled callbacks. That's, that's right. smart. Now this particular deal, right? So you, you did pick it up from a wholesaler. So mm -hmm. you paid him that four. So that takes your total acquisition cost to 37 grand. Mm -hmm. Now I'm assuming since you picked it up from him, he did all of that type of stuff. You know, he worked with the seller, found those pain points. So you probably weren't involved in all that. So let's just get into the nuts and bolts of the flip. Let's, let's pick things up from after you sign, close, got the deed in your name. Tell yep. me how this all went down. Uh, yeah, so we actually pre-closing was um, kind of a fiasco. The the sellers, and you know how it is with a, with a wholesaler. You're kind of like the wholesalers in the middle between you and the sellers. Um, there's a lot of back and forth. And these, these uh, particular sellers had a lot of stuff going on. So there was a lot of back and forth. This, this was supposed to close in a couple of weeks, and it wound up taking eight weeks to close. Um, and we had to put a little bit more money um, down on the table take a little bit more risk. Um, but once we finally closed on <laughs> the late evening of, I think it was December 20th or something like that, there was a lot of drama. Um, but yeah, we, we went in and all that shit that you see in the house, the first step is to uh, send, send a crew in there, order two, three, four dumpsters and get it out well, so, you can, so you can see what you're dealing with. If we could, I, I would like to rewind just a bit. You said there was a lot of drama. I think yeah. it's it's pretty important, I think, for the viewers to actually get a taste of like what that drama is. Because, you know, you watch like HGTV and yeah. I feel like they don't really include a lot of that drama. But, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. it's not really about the, the house all the time. We got people we got to deal with. Like, what do you have to deal with? Well, so one, one issue was that the sellers of the house were not the people that were living there. So all that, the condition of the house that you see in those pictures was caused by uh, their tenants, their long-term tenants who were also part of their family. Um, so it was not just me and the wholesaler and the sellers, but it was also some tenants involved. These tenants had kids and pets. Um, they didn't exactly uh, have a sense of urgency about getting their crap out. 
um, and moving and finding a new place. Um, so there was, there was a lot of drama there about finding a place for them uh, to go. Uh, and then there was some additional drama towards the end of that process about um, the timing of the closing. And uh, once the seller saw their, their settlement statement, it being a surprise to them on how much money they were actually getting back because um, <laughs> somehow they were surprised to find out that they actually had to have paid taxes over the last four or five years. Um, and that was all coming out of their net. So th there was a lot of people involved. There was a, there, and at least two of those parties were under distress. Um, they weren't obviously as motivated as we were to um, get this deal done. And so we just kind of had to be patient. We kind of had to be understanding. Uh, we, we actually made some concessions for the sellers, which included paying some of their back taxes. Um, and so it was just kind of, yeah, finagling and finessing the situation to make sure we actually got to the closing table. Nice. Okay, good. And I think that's great substance. You know, a lot of folks, they don't understand exactly, you know, they look at, oh man, Harvey made 31 grand. It probably only took him a few months. I might only make that in the whole year, but there's a lot of finagling that goes in uh, yeah. to this business. And that's the purpose of right. the show. We like to highlight that. Mm -hmm. So back to picking it back up then. So you did close, you went in, you got a few dumpsters. You removed all the shit that we saw in the house. Then what'd you do? Yep. So once we got it kind of to kind of to a clean slate, um, then we then we could piece it back together, really. So we were um, painting, um, redoing the flooring. Started uh, two of the things we did. Obviously, was replace the two exterior doors and secure the property, which is a key first step, um, especially if you're in a kind of a distressed neighborhood. Was this a pretty distressed neighborhood? Uh, you know, it, the, the neighborhood itself is actually pretty good, but it's, um, it's in proximity to a distressed neighborhood. And we actually got broken into one time, um, which could be the case in any neighborhood if, a, you know, if people know that it's vacant and it's being worked on. Um, but yeah, I mean, this was actually our very first flip. <laughs> so there was a lot of lessons we learned uh, in this flip that, that we've taken to other projects. But the first of which being, make sure you go ahead and... Uh, uh, change out the locks at least, but probably change the two exterior doors um, or the exterior doors and get the place secured. Based in Indianapolis, Indiana, FS Houses is the premier investment property brokerage with an in-house property management department that can take care of all those unwanted landlord headaches. FS Houses can offer you the complete turnkey solution as well as wholesale properties offered to you at a discounted rate. With a network of thousands of active investors, wholesalers, and brokers, FS Houses can help you sell your property for top dollar on the open market or in a hurry to motivated investors seeking distressed real estate. Visit fshouses.com or call 317-492-9025 for more information on the Indianapolis, Indiana real estate. Now the work that you guys did now, this was your first deal. So like, were you doing a lot of that stuff yourself? Did you hire out contractors? I'm assuming you may have more systems in place today as I'm talking to you, but back then when you were doing this deal, like mm -hmm. what was the systems in place? Are you bringing in contractors to give you bids? How did it all go down? I actually, while we were in contract negotiation, I had one contractor come out uh, and give me a bid and we liked his bid. So we used, we used him. Uh, we did none of the work ourselves. Um, that is like the, the labor. We didn't swing any hammers. Uh, we designed the kitchen. We picked out all the materials. In fact, I spent a lot of time picking up materials and bringing it to the job site. Um, but our, from a system standpoint, we were really austere at the time and just kind of, I think we had a good plan, but obviously that plan, um, kind of goes to shit once it, once things start um, going and um, we get underway. Um, but yeah, so we did not swing any hammers. We had a contractor um, and we just spent a lot of time keeping the project moving, um, picking up, picking out materials, picking up materials, that sort of thing. Now you use like a, a really large contracting firm. It's, it's not typical of a large firm like that to have the clients, the customers actually delivering supplies and building materials to the property. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, why did you end up doing that? What was the relationship like with you and your contractor that like led to you being that involved? Yeah, I think it was just kind of the way that he operates. Um, when, when he bid, he bid just labor and he said that we would be responsible for um, all the material. And, you know, we didn't know any better being in our first project. So that's just kind of the way it went. I think, uh, and we've used them on um, other projects since then. And we still pick out all the materials, which we like. We like to have control of that. Um, but they'll, they'll actually now go and get the material, which I think makes sense because, you know, I can't be driving around town picking up doors and trim and drywall. Um, there's other things that I could be doing. So I think that we've, we've resolved that issue, but that, that's, that's really why we did that on the first project just because we didn't really know any better. Now it sounds like you're, you're, you're pretty hands-on, right? I mean, you know, you guys are pretty committed to this. Mm -hmm. So if someone watching this, right you know, they could be two kind of flippers, right? There could be somebody like you doing it all the time, super hands-on, or there might be somebody that's got a, a full-time job, a career. They just want to invest their money. You know, being mm -hmm. that you've been involved, do you think it makes sense for that person to hire a contractor like yours that, you know, you're going to be a little bit more involved? You're essentially acting kind of like the, the, the main general contractor, really, and he's more or less right. a sub under your staff. Or do you think it makes sense for folks to, go with one of those big operations that has like their own marketing budget. Cause there's pros and cons to both. What are your thoughts on that being in the business, doing a bunch of deals now? Yeah, I think, uh, it's obviously situation dependent and dependent on how much time you have. I, it's pretty labor intensive to kind of run the project yourself. Like we were it's and time intensive. I'd say if you're working a nine to five job, that'd be really difficult to pop in on a project, you know, at noon on a Thursday, um, or show up every Friday to the job and uh, make sure they're on track and they're getting paid and what have you. I think, you know, I think if you can find a company that will do that for you and you can trust them and you have some good documentation in place, um, and some good processes in place, it could work for you if you were, working a full-time job now this was your first deal and you said you designed a lot of the stuff right so you're choosing mm -hmm. all the stuff now mm -hmm. looking at your kitchen bro i gotta say i, I like the kitchen man you picked out some some good yeah. materials the home it makes sense right mm -hmm. uh it looks like you got white shaker cabinets there you know i like the stainless steel package being that that was your first deal like what led you to pick out the particular materials that you picked out that's my wife man she uh you know, I don't, I don't know what I would have done in there. I might have done something similar, but yeah, she, she did a really nice job in there. Um, that, those countertops, for instance, those are laminate countertops, um, kind of like higher end laminate countertops. It costs us like all those countertops cost us like 350 bucks. Um, but yeah, that's, that's all her just kind of, um, being a little bit more in touch with what, um, what the trends are and what's marketable. I would say though, that it, if you, if you don't have someone like my wife um, or you're trying to figure this out on your own, just look at the comps in your area and look and see what, what kind of ARV you're trying to get and what the comps in your area that are at that are ARV, what, what kind of kitchen designs and appliance packages and cabinetry have they been putting in there? Because that's really ultimately that's your competition. That's kind of the standard you're trying to get to. Now I'm glad you I'm glad you mentioned the actual material used in the countertops and the the relative uh, it, you know cheapness of it right you spend right. a few hundred bucks on those right I think that goes back to the the neighborhood right you know you said it's like kind of yeah. on the verge of being mm -hmm. a lower end neighborhood I mean the Columbus market not a lot of people that are watching this are gonna know specifics about the Columbus market but just so everyone knows guys the Columbus market it's probably the most expensive market in the entire state of Ohio. Mm -hmm. So $150,000 exit on a rehabbed house, that's, you know, probably in the lower end of, you know, the general market out there. Like we see homes in the Columbus market in the three, four, five, six hundred thousand dollar $600,000 range all the time. Right. So in a low value comparatively, right? A low value neighborhood in this market, you can get away with that. And you guys probably saved like what? seven eight thousand dollars going that route yeah several yeah i mean we saved a lot of money going that route for sure but you're right the, 
it was driven mostly by the neighborhood. You know, if we were in a higher end neighborhood, um, which we've done as well, you know, you got to have solid surface countertops in there just because that's what every house on the street has. And if you want to, yeah, go ahead. What price point neighborhood, like what type of ARVs is like the, like what's the cutoff for using a lower cost material versus going with your granite or your quartz? What's the cutoff for you guys? Generally, probably high 100s or 200 as a good, as a good cutoff. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Very good. That's very smart. And that's, that's super important, guys. You got to know your market because if he spent another seven G's, you know, he wouldn't, he would not have got a return on that. He probably would have just lost that. So very smart decision out of you and your wife mm -hmm. uh, on your first deal. And I, I like what you did with the rest of the home. You guys didn't try to get too creative here, right? Like, right. is that agreeable gray? Is that the agreeable color? Agreeable gray, baby. Yep. Every yeah. project, agreeable gray. That's the color we use for our portfolio. It's the, just so everyone's aware, guys, that is the most popular interior color in the United States of America. And you just went with, you know, Brush nickel hardware, neutral mm -hmm. carpet on the upstairs. Uh, did you guys do like a lot of research before you decided to flip this house? Because I'm looking at the house and I'm, I'm actually surprised because when you reached out to us to come on the show, you're a guy who's doing a lot of flips. And based on, you know, what you presented to me, I, I didn't think this was your first flip at all. It looks like guys that, you know, you guys have a system in place. So like, how, how did you end up doing this with, what appears to me be no rookie mistakes. Like if, if this is like a first deal, I expect you guys to do something crazy, like a bunch of weird feature walls or <laughs> overspending on this or that. But you guys made a lot of like veteran moves. Was that like, what type of self-education went into you guys' business before you did this deal? Well, I mean, so this is our first flip, um, but we have re rehabbed other houses, um, including our, you know, our own primary residences. Uh, so we kind of knew kind of the vibe and the feel that we wanted to go with, which was, which is what you see just being clean and simple. Um, and then on top of that, just having a, a contractor who with flip experience and rehab experience who can kind of, and, and our contract was a huge help on our, in our first flip. There was things that we didn't account for things that we didn't plan for um, that just because they've done this so often, they, they kind of held our hand a little bit on, on a few things. Like what specifically? You got a couple examples? Well, for instance, um, in our, in, and I have this on our first blog post, we didn't even, we didn't even budget for uh, trim or baseboard, um, which if, you, if you've never done a complete rehab on a house, it may be kind of an easy thing to overlook. Uh, you think flooring, you think paint, you think windows, you think kitchen, bath, you think all the big, big things. Um, but, you know, if it weren't for him uh, early on kind of pointing us toward the fact that we're going to have to replace all this trim and baseboard, um, and you might want to start looking for that now um, and, and budgeting for it, you know, some, something as simple as that. I mean, that's, that's a couple thousand dollars that we just overlooked. Um, but yeah. So, so that's kind of how that, that end product is definitely the result of a complete team effort and the experience of some people that we had that we brought on to our team to, uh, to help us through our first project. Nice. And it turned out well. Let's, let's break down the numbers here. So mm -hmm. we went over this. You picked it up. Total acquisition cost, 37 grand. Mm -hmm. How much did that renovation cost you? So it wound up costing us about 59. 59? 60. Mm -hmm. 60 59 60 okay yeah. and as far as the selling and holding cost it looks like you provided uh my team here it looks like you provided us your estimate for that and that was twenty two thousand. how did you sell it how did you market it what happened there uh so yeah so once we got it finished up we obviously had some professional pictures taken and um which i always recommend no matter the price point um, but then I'm a real estate agent, so I was able to list it. And um, once it was listed, it was less than 24 hours. We had multiple offers and most of them at asking or above. And, you know, we, we picked one out and away we went. I always recommend everybody that wants to get in the game and wants to do this like as a full-time business uh, to always get a real estate license. You'd be insane not to. Mm -hmm. What are some of the benefits? Obviously, you probably feel the same way that you're a real estate agent and 
seemed mm-hmm. like a pretty smart guy. You're not making any mistakes on your first deal. What are some <laughs> of the benefits uh, of being a realtor when you want to be a flipper? Like, why well, does it make you better? Yeah, well, I mean, the the easy answer is just that it saves us on that that um, listing commission on the back end, um, and probably the purchase commission on the front end. Um, and then there's some there's some other residual benefits, uh, like, you know, if I'm spending more time in the market helping other investors i'm obviously more in tune to what's going on um and then the more i'm in the the investor realm uh i get the more referrals i get for my for my real estate business and especially if you're if you're just starting out and you can get you know a couple clients and sell a couple properties and help some people out that just i mean that just funds your your uh, investment business so yeah i just I think it's a no brainer. I mean, you can go get your license for a couple thousand dollars or whatever it is in your area um, and save yourself multiple thousands of dollars down the road. Yeah. It's, I think it's a, it's a slam dunk. hundred percent agree. So you end up selling this bad boy, 150,000. Was it a smooth closing, tough closing? how did it all go? You know, the, it was smoother than the purchase, but there were some remedy items um, that we missed. Uh, we missed some mold in the attic. Um, we missed um, a couple other things around the house. We wound up spending a couple more thousand dollars in the remedy period, which, you know, for people who aren't real estate agents, that's, that just means, you know, the the purchaser, uh, we went into contract, they did an inspection, and then they, they came back and asked for us to um, kind of fix or redo a couple things um, as part of the contract before closing. So, you know, it, our whole thing is we're going to provide a quality product. So, you know, we didn't really barter or um, try to be cheap on any of that stuff. Uh, We also realized we were working with somebody who was purchasing their first home and we know what that's like to purchase our first home. Um, So we wanted to make sure we did things right. So if we had to spend a couple thousand more dollars to make sure that the house was, um, you know, was this nice, solid, nice house for those buyers. And that's what we did. I think that's a smart move, man. That, that is like a, a big veteran move. I, I get a, I see, I see this all the time. I see people, they look at their deal, right. And they look at their deal in a vacuum and they're, they're thinking, I gotta, my job as an investor is to maximize every single dollar I can out of this deal. Mm-hmm. But what you did more or less, you're saying, yeah, basically I, I left a little bit of money on the table. Cause I understand I'm a pro I'm doing this. I'm a licensed agent. I got a business. I want to do this full time. I want to have, motivated sellers reach out to me these right. folks this is not their business their first time home buyers mm-hmm. was a lot of like you leaving some of that money on the table making it an easy process was a lot of that thinking bigger picture for your overall business oh absolutely yeah i mean we i mean we don't want to put bad product out there whether it's because there are actual consequences of it if somebody finds out oh that you know this company they did this project and it was shit and you know, nobody wants to buy our houses down the road. Maybe that would have happened. Maybe it wouldn't. I think the biggest thing is just, can we, can we sleep at night and can we look ourselves in the mirror? And that's really why, I mean, if we treat people the right way from the time we sit down with them in the living room until the time we, we sell it and close on the, on the, uh, at the end of the project, if we do all that stuff, right, we're just going to, we're going to feel good about ourselves. Um, and, you know, we believe that if we put good out there, we're going to get good back. So that's why we, that's why we do business that way. Perfect, man. That's awesome. Um, can you give us, can you give the audience, uh, let's just have you plug your stuff. Like where can we find you? If people want to reach out to you, where are you buying houses? Just hit me with the pitch. Yep. We're in Columbus, Ohio, and we are, we can be found at homevestors.com. Uh, we are always looking for uh, properties, obviously. Um, you can, you can find out more about what home is, is all about and what we do at home Um, or you can email me at harvey.jurgen at home And I'm also all over bigger pockets. I have a blog, um, and I'm in the forums constantly. And if you are in the Columbus area and you hit me up and you want to get coffee or lunch, I'm always down for that too. All right. Special thanks to Harvey for coming on, talking with us today. 
Uh, again, I'm just incredibly impressed with how well they did that flip, given that it was his first ever flip. And he's also in the same state as us, right? We're up here in the Cleveland market. Harvey is down there doing work in the Columbus, Ohio market. Uh, here at Holton Wise, we don't do too much uh, as far as real estate sales in the Columbus market, but Harvey does. Sounds like he works with investors and uh, things of that nature. So if you folks are interested in doing any deals down in Columbus, again, I've got Harvey. Harvey's contact information, all of his content in the show notes below. In addition to that, uh, Holton Wise, as you know, we are affiliated with the Hogue Insurance Agency and Black Tie Title. Black Tie Title can handle title work in all of Ohio. So if you guys are down there, we got other Columbus folks who came to this video due to the Columbus keywords. Uh, if you guys are trying to do deals and you need a quality title company to work with, we've got the information for Black Tie Title in the show notes below. And then, of course, anybody flipping houses, rental property owners, anybody who needs property insurance, Hogue Insurance, contact information in the show notes below, investor focused insurance company. We are licensed in Ohio as well as many other states. So if you'd like to lower your insurance, reach out and get a quote today. That's pretty much everything I've got for you guys. If you yourself are flipping houses and you are interested in telling your story here on the House Flipping Show, we would love to hear it. doesn't matter if you're a brand new flipper, seasoned flipper. I don't care. I think every single flip has got some educational information that we can all learn. So if you flip the house and you want to talk to me about it here on the show, uh, put it in the comments below and my media team will reach out to you. Before you get out of here, if you guys could please do us a favor and smash that like button. And of course, this is the first time you've ever seen anything here on Holton Wise TV. Do yourself a favor and smash that subscribe button. As always, I'm James Wise with Holton Wise, and this is Real Estate Investing Made Easy. Back, 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 back to those days. I was running, 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 running in one place. Set a, set a, set a, set a, set a, set a, set a pace. Feel like I've been, I've been, I've been, I've been running in one place. Yeah, I've been feeling pretty good. I've been feeling great. I've been feeling how I should, how I really should. Rent Tech Direct provides you with an easy-to-use yet robust platform for managing your properties, complete with its built-in reporting and accounting system that can be customized to fit your business. You can manage work orders and even accept them online from your tenants. You can also share work order details with tenants or owners if you wish. With Rent Tech Direct, you'll also fill your vacancies faster than ever with the built-in marketing tools. Just enter the details of your property and Rent Tech will automatically provide you with a professional online website as well as syndicate them to popular websites such as Zillow, Trulia and Apartments.com to get your listing maximum exposure so it's rented fast. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on our latest content, including video tours and analysis of investment properties that are available for sale, real estate investment education, and our most interesting encounters with tenants from health. Holton Wise, real estate investing made easy.